Well, thank you, Justin. And I'd like to start by thanking um, Iris and the Iris staff for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, the I think the main goal today um, is sort of as a reflect back on what's really 25 years of running Pascal experiments in Alaska is just really to show how the infrastructure that IRIS supports has contributed to the science of understanding subduction systems in general through Alaska and really focusing on these portable array programs. And um, we go to, a, this is a picture of the Wrangell Volcanic Field uh, in Alaska. And this is an example of the sort of the kind of very dramatic ways in which sort of the forces that build the planet are expressed up there. Um, for those of you who, I don't know who you'd be, but if uh, you're uh, on this call and don't know where Alaska is, it's um, a few different ways that we can talk about how Alaska is really in many sense, um, a world-class subduction zone, um, sort of the archetypical place to study a lot of problems. For example, um, of the 18 magnitude 8.4 and larger earthquakes since 1900, four of them are in the Alaska Aleutian system. Um, it represents about 10% of the global arc system by so a long strike length, or a little more model dependent, about 9% of the flux of uh, volatile particulate uh, water um, into the trench, into the mantle of the earth. And so there's a lot of ways that this is sort of, you know, North America's big system for studying subduction processes. Um, and I think you know, there's one takeaway from this talk, it's that in order to study these systems, the processes that are really important are happening at scales where um, fairly dense sampling of seismic wave fields are needed um, to image the appropriate parts of these systems to really make sense out of them. And um, the main human trick that we've sort of, seismometer trick that we're doing here is we're building arrays that are you know 10 or 15 kilometers spacing incredibly powerful tool for understanding these systems okay so i've been uh doing this uh well doing these broadband arrays supported by pascal i think the first one started in 1999 i'll go through some of these in detail but they have names like moose bear wolf and ace and they're all misspelled for various cute reasons and this is just showing, reminding us that you know doing field work here is not as simple as it might be in some places. Um, there's you know, few places we're able to get to by roads. We take advantage of those heavily, but there's a lot of issues with you know, boats and planes. And no matter where we go, of course, um, we have this other environmental challenge of these very large brown animals that um, sometimes are unhappy when seismometers are in their yards. So um, we don't talk too much about that. But I do wanna do is acknowledge that you know, this is work um, from a number of projects that have a vast number of collaborators, assistants, and so on. And I just want to send a big thank you. Um, <clears throat> the ones in the mainland of Alaska are, you know, first and foremost, need to acknowledge Doug Christensen, who is my co-PI on all of these, but a large number of undergraduates, graduate students, other collaborators, and of course, the personnel in the Pascal Instruments that have made this possible. You'll see some familiar names here. This has been a great sort of springboard for a lot of people going forward. And then most recently, the Amphibious Community Seismic Experiment has an army of co-PIs and helpers and students and um, staff, both from Pascal and the OBS support facilities. So thank you to all of you. And of course, none of this would be possible without just you know, near continuous support from the National Science Foundation, both for us doing the science and for the underlying facilities. Okay, so going back in time, um, I thought I'd make a map uh, of the broadband data that were running, flowing into the Pascal Instruments Center, say around 1997. Um, there are three, you can see, in two near Fairbanks and one on Kodiak that had just started. Um, it, well, this, these are not a great imaging tool, but it does sort of beg the question, there's a lot of opportunity here. The black lines are showing sort of where the roads or the road-like things are in the area. And um, that'll become important because they sort of give us some ideas of targets. The blue lines are showing, so depths to slab seismicity at 50 kilometer intervals. So show you where a lot of the targets might be in subduction systems. Um, so these are <coughs> the uh, three on-land projects that are basically designed around the road system in Alaska, uh, where 
started, so Bayer starting in 1999 uh, is a broadband experiment across the Alaska range. Um, Moose is a, a multidisciplinary observation of subduction that extends that south through the 1964 earthquake rupture zone in the Kenai Peninsula. And most recent, the Wrangell Volcanism Lithospheric Fate Experiment um, allowed us to look off the edge of the slab around the Wrangell Volcanics. Um, but we're able to put in far uh, more station density in these areas, largely because there are roads or we're close to roads and we can get around pretty quickly. Um, of course, by the time we started Wolf, um, we were greatly aided by the transportable array showing up in Alaska that provides this really wonderful um, lower density background sampling of seismic wave fields. Um, and then to address the last problem, which is these things stopping at the shoreline, um, the Alaska Amphibious Community Seismic Experiment then extended um, in a variety, you know, variable density offshore onto the downgoing plate. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Most of the talk that I'm going to do is focus on um, parts where we actually have a story to tell from the onshore fields. Um, this is actually all the broadband data that are in the DMC from uh, in permanent or Pascal experiments. And you can see there's a couple of others, um, most notably uh, in the far southeastern corner is the steep experiment in the St. Elias region. And then um, running across Cook Inlet and behind the arc behind it is the, is the salmon project that a couple of, that, that also contribute. And when you look at this all together, I mean, it's really phenomenal to see how much we have improved our ability, well, to image by, over two decades putting down size on just want to quickly compare this to this map. It's sort of fun to go back and forth, right? Um, and you sort of see this, you know, I take a sense of pride in having contributed to this, but all this data is open. Everyone can play with it. Um, and you can see what we're also doing is we're sampling a lot of different pieces of the subduction system, um, crossing a few different really important segment boundaries. Um, for those of you not familiar with Alaska, so a simple way to think about this is that in the West, the Aleutian Arc, the Black Triangle is now our volcanoes, um, extends along the Alaska Peninsula where normal Pacific plate is subducting. Um, great earthquakes, 1964, 1938, and then most recently, 2020, and it's 2021 earthquake in July, um, <clears throat> re-ruptured in the 1938 zone, um, closer to the trench. Uh, the seismogenic zone gets about 100 kilometers deep beneath the arc. But then as you go farther uh, east than about Cook Inlet, that's the big bay where it's a 50 kilometers there, um, the material that's subducting, and we'll show you how we know this from these arrays, um, is no longer normal oceanic crust. It's the Yakutat terrain, uh, oceanic plateau, it's much thicker. Um, and notably, this last few hundred kilometers, there's really no volcanism. There's a couple of tiny vents right at the end. This is the Denali segment. Then there's a gap, slab seismicity ends. There's a very sparse intermediate, as we will show you. Um, but there's something going on under the Wrangell volcanic field, which is also down dip of the Yakutat terrain. So there's at least you know, three major segments. There's this Alaska Peninsula Cook Inlet segment, this Denali segment that has seismicity, no volcanism, and this Wrangell volcanic field, intense volcanism. There and fairly feeble seismicity. Um, and so that's what, you know, if you go back to this map, you can see we now have samples of all of these segments and the transitions between them. So um, <clears throat> the first part uh, was putting stitching together uh, in 1999 to 2009, or about 10 years in two phases. We can look back on now along the road system. Um, this dense line of broadband seismometers that span mostly this Denali segment. Um, we say we're oversampling the wave field and that the instrument spacing is smaller than certainly a lot of the teleseismic waves that we look at, the wavelengths of them. Um, we're crossing in the south uh, the biggest asperity that broke in the magnitude 9.2 earthquake in 1964. This is uh, one of the perhaps one of the largest asperities on the planet that's been identified. As we go down, if we cross the highest mountains in North America, the Denali Fault, um, we're falling a subducting plate down to, we'll see, but it's about 20, 150 kilometers depth. Um, and I'm going to show you a series of plots that are along cross sections like this, basically running down dip. Um, and this is, so the first one, this is just receiver functions. Those you probably all know what receiver functions are by now. It was looking at 
where zero function is from one, well, it's like two earthquakes. They're both about in the same place in the Hindu Kush. The red ones were recorded in uh, early 2000 on Bear, and the pink ones in, I think, 2007 or eight on the Moose Array. Um, but we can sort of stitch them together. And you can see pretty clearly without, you know, it's from one earthquake, one set of receiver functions, you see pretty clearly where the subducting clite is. There's a blue line, but you don't really need it, right? This kind of imaging makes it really simple to see first order structure. And of course, a lot more data we can, we'll see, we can learn a lot more, but um, <clears throat> it's interesting then to compare this to, um, oh, say if we just decimated this to 80, sorry, decimated this to 85 kilometer spacing, I think it's very hard to see where the coherent structures are. At this scale, we're spatially aliasing the important structures. And again, that's sort of the main point here is that we need this kind of density in order to be able to get to, um, really see the features that matter at scales where they change. Um, so we can, of course, look at a lot of these events. This is um, taking both of those arrays now, stitching them together through a series of projects using a, a two-dimensional um, scattered wave imaging technique pioneered by uh, Mike Bostock and Stefan Rondine, um, where we are inverting the scattered teleseismic wave field for variations in S wave velocity. So um, the red is the slow, the blue is the fast, and the sharp gradients between them are the boundaries that are generating scattered waves, P to S conversions for the most part on uh, reflections. Um, and what you can see is that, you know, we can image a fairly continuous subducting plate going down to depths of at least about 130 kilometers before they crap out. There's something like an upper plate moho. Um, <clears throat> but we see, and, and you know, it's sort of in two parts at the shallow depths at distances less than about 180 kilometers on this horizontal scale. We see a thin, very low velocity zone that's probably um, around the thrust zone, the plate interface contact. And deeper, we see something that's somewhat thicker um, that seems to be, we'll argue, the downgoing um, subducting crust. Um, the, down, the subducting crust looks to be in these images, and every time we try to test it, somewhere between 12 and 20, 22 kilometers thick in that kind of range. Um, so it's resolvably thicker than oceanic crust. This is old news. Um, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, uh, but what's interesting is that it's very similar to uh, what we see if we go off the south coast uh, in um, the late 2000s. 10, 15 years ago, uh, the steep project had a large active source offshore components. Um, a, a couple of papers show this imaging from steep one from Worthington at all 2012, um, where they're imaging the crust of this Yakutat terrain. This Yakutat basement looks resolvably fast with not really much internal structure. It looks a lot like an oceanic plateau. So that's probably the best guess is that there's a thick oceanic plateau, the velocities match oceanic plateaus in other places. And um, it looks like it's somewhat thicker as you go in the east, maybe up to 30 kilometers, and it thins to 15, 18 kilometers as you go to the west. But it looks very similar to what we're imaging underneath the Alaska range at 100 kilometers depth. So we would, and we would argue that this, what's subducting here is in fact that. Um, this is just another version of that same image. This isn't now a scattered wave image. This is a back projection of receiver functions where we have some sort of dip constraints. Um, in this case, the orange are negative conversions and the blue are positive conversions. So you can see you know, the top and the bottom of a low velocity channel, the dots are earthquakes, but all seem to be inside the channel. And you can also see some other features like the big blue, that's probably the upper plate crust and some internal structure in the upper plate. And so, um, we would argue that from these data, there's been a lot of evidence that we are in fact subducting this thick Yakutat crust. It subducts, I'm saying, uneclogitized to 130 kilometers depth. Um, basaltic crust transforms to eclogite at high pressures and temperatures, but eclogite has velocities that are very similar to periditite at these conditions. So the fact that we see it means this hasn't happened yet. Um, we're also seeing things that look like terrain boundaries in the upper plate. These are very shallow dipping interfaces that look similar to what people have seen in active source data nearby. And earthquakes that seem to lie inside subducting crust. Um, we've continued this kind of work uh, with the wolf data. The, rang this is the blue dots are 
um, the Wrangell Volcanic Field Array we put out together with the existing um, permanent network and transportable array data in the area. Uh, and the green and orange again are the moose and bear arrays. And what we're able to do now is to compare that Denali segment to this Wrangell segment, which has been kind of confusing because it's sort of weak seismicity and some models seem to show us abducting slabs, some don't. Um, but I want to draw your attention to a sort of this figure, this somewhat complicated figure on the right, um, this section D, D prime, it's actually following the purple dots. It's not quite along the line, but that's the projection azimuth. And if you look at that, you can see, so now the red and the blue are the top and bottom of this low velocity channel. It's the same thing we've been looking at. It's just flipped around um, for moose. And you can see it gets shallower as you go from D to D prime. E, E prime now goes in a different direction down the teal triangles or, or the Richardson Highway line of the um, Wolf experiment. And you can see very similar, but much more steeping dipping structures. But if you look, the yellow star indicates the same station on both of these lines. You can see that the um, Wrangell Field uh, Richardson Highway line projects much deeper. At, uh, well, these are times, this is stacked receiver functions to you know, 15, 16 seconds versus something that's on the order of five, six, seven seconds underneath it here. So these are really pretty clearly two different slabs. Another way to look at this is on this map. So these colors show the lag time for the P to S conversion and receiver functions. These are all from one set of back azimuths. And you can see at shallow depths is a very continuous um, smooth <coughs> sort of thrust zone down to, and we'll see what the depths are, but it's probably down to 30 kilometers or so. And then very quickly, as we get near the Wrangell volcanic field, um, the slab is much steeper there. We get down, down to time, delay times like 14 seconds there. Those are you know a couple hundred kilometers farther inland in underneath the uh, Denali range. So um, you can see right away, we're able to image two slabs, but they look different. There seems to be something like a tear in here. Um, <clears throat> this is what happens if we take now that Wrangell data, slightly different subset of stations and do the same 2D migration. Um, and you can see pretty clearly, we're seeing fairly thick subducted crust. This case is a little thicker, 18 plus or minus four kilometers, but it's very close to what we're seeing offshore. Um, we're also able to see a pretty clear continental or upper plate moho. Um, and then there's some other interesting mantle structures. But the important point here is that the subducting crest again is reaching depths of like 100 kilometers beneath the arc. Um, we think you know, this data together with seismicity, I'll talk about it in a second, you know, is probably you know, very clearly shows that the Wrangell volcanic field is a subduction zone, there's subducting crust under it. Um, again, like we saw in the Denali segment, the earthquakes appear to be within the subducting crust. Um, and then as we go up dip, it's um, fairly continuous structure all the way to sort of where we lose imaging near the coastline. So um, the, the picture of this being a normal subduction zone, albeit with very thick crust, seems to hold up. There's also a lot of interesting upper plate seismicity and things like that, but um, I want to sort of focus on this. But I think what this is showing is that here too, the Yakutat plate is subducting. It's dipping in a different direction, and there seems to be a break between these two slab segments. Um, to get a bit of an, uh, another handle on sort of the nature of subduction here, uh, we'll look at seismic attenuation. This has been another great tool that I'm having high, well calibrated broadband instruments have been helpful for. This is um, an old figure from old bear data. We look at an earthquake at 100 kilometers deep, two stations the same distance apart, um, showing the S waves. And you can see this tremendous enrichment and high frequency energy in some directions and it's just gone in other directions. And we can use the spectral fall off to quantify attenuation um, using um, Q or T star, your favorite parameters. And so we do this with local earthquakes and frequencies of about a half a Hertz up to 10 or 20 Hertz, depending on the data. Um, we're able then to do tomography uh, where we can solve for uh, Q or one over Q is sort of the effect of attenuation. So red is more attenuating um, and you know, presumably it's hotter, absorbing energy a lot faster. The really blue stuff, the dark blue stuff is almost unattenuating completely. And this is from the bear data. And sorry that the dip direction changes from left to right on different figures. Different students have different opinions about which direction down dip should be. But um, what you can see, I mean, there's a number of things you can see, but the main thing is that 
the most of the mantle ridge is very red, very attenuating. But once the seismicity is less than about 70 or 80 kilometers deep, what's above it um, shows almost no attenuation at all. So there's a sharp boundary between high and low attenuation regions. And we think this is really first order signal of thermal structure. And this is at least an order of magnitude and attenuation. So this is not a small thing. Um, and we can quantify this by thermal models, um, but you know, I think the boundary and the sharpness of it is something we've seen, not just here, but in a lot of other subduction zones around the world. But this is one of the first ones where I think we really image this well using this bare data. So we can look at both of these sections together here. I, because I was annoyed, I flipped this image around so it's the same direction as the migrated um, receiver function image. And so we can use the receiver function image to get geometry and earthquakes and the attenuation image to help us think about thermal structure. We can compare this to thermal models. And um, you know what we can see, so we can generate thermal models. They have the same geometry as what the receiver functions are showing it should be. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot more to this story, but the model on the bottom is sort of a first cut run if you just subduct cold oceanic lithosphere um, that drives wedge flow. So you bring hot stuff into the corner and if you just let that happen on its own. Um, that hot stuff tries to creep as far up as it can go and you wind up with very hot um, stuff above sort of the, the forearc mantle. And that seems to be inconsistent with the attenuation data and the temperature structure you infer from that. So this, we've used this here, and we've seen this again in a lot of other places around the world, but as good evidence that the plate boundary that localizes slip continues much deeper than so the great earthquakes. The great earthquakes here go down to maybe 40, 45 kilometers depth, um, but we need sort of that dislocation to go down to about 80 kilometers depth. What that does is that means that the stuff above it down to about 80 kilometers depth um, is not being dragged downward by the downgoing plate. It's just sitting there. It's isolated from the mantle wedge flow and it cools down because you're evicting cold oceanic, or in this case, <coughs> um, oceanic plateau lithosphere beneath it. And so these seismic observations have been really critical to be able to sort of validate these kinds of ideas of you know, what we're calling the cold nose, this is cold part of forex. Um, again, we've seen this here, we've seen this in Central America, we've seen this in Japan, we've seen this in a number of other places around the world, this kind of structure. Um, but I think this Alaska data was, was really one of the, the key ones that sort of made this happen. Um, more recently, we've tried to extend this to the Wrangell volcanic field. There's not that many earthquakes in the slab, so we can't really do the tomography, but what we've started to do instead um, is use a method, and this is actually pioneered by um, Zach Aylan, and he's a student, um, looking at uh, differential attenuation from teleseism. So this uh, the figure on the right um, shows S waves from two stations recording the same earthquake, and you can right away see the red earth signal has a lot less high frequency energy than the black signal. In this case, high frequency, though, is like one hertz or half a hertz or a quarter hertz. And so we can fit the amplitude differences and actually the phase differences to come up with differential attenuation operators between these two stations. Their you know, attenuation causes amplitude fall off and phase delay. And so we've done that for, um, <clears throat> in this case, we've taken uh, the Wrangell volcanic field data and all the TA data and permanent network data that we can find sort of in a big area of Southern Alaska. This is by Roque Soto Castaneda that was published earlier this year. And what so is plotted, the top two panels are for P waves and S waves. He was on the left, S is on the right. Um, the average attenuation operator at each of those stations based on all of these differential pairs. So it's a lot like what people do with travel times to get individual stations. And the main thing, and the, and the bottom one does show the same thing for just the travel times, um, sort of the more traditional measurement that goes into teleseismic tomography. Um, these are station averages. So there's a lot that's like, you know, tomography still needs to be done and is being worked on. Um, but what we can see pretty clearly is the places where we think um, there's cold subducting lithosphere going down and then that's at depths less than 70 or 80 or 90 kilometers. We're seeing, um, again, very, in this case, negative T star. So there's very little attenuation compared to what's behind the arc and then actually all the way up north into the Alaska interior. 
Um, so we think that this is also kind of showing us a little bit sort of the continuity of subduction. It gets kind of complicated as you get in the Southeast, which we're not too surprised about, but it seems to be, again, sort of good um, idea that this is where subduction is. Interestingly, this seems a lot more localized and like the thermal models than say the travel time data. We think it's because attenuation is very sensitive to temperature in the very shallowest part of the mantle where you're closest to solidus conditions or maybe melt is present. Um, whereas the travel time data are more sensitive to the elastic part of the structure. And so they're seeing much more of the deeper part of the slab throughout the upper mantle. So that's why it's extending farther north. That's one explanation. There's also deeper, there's obviously something that's very slow in the Southeast corner that you know, maybe some people have imaged down at the transition zones. There's a lot of things going into this, but we think this attenuation data is telling us a lot more about sort of that upper 150 kilometers of the subduction system. Um, I think I just said all that. Uh, so if we look at, um, now this is just taking that same data along two cross sections. Uh, the one on the left is Cross Cook Inlet, the one on the right is across the Rainbow Volcanic Field, the two little thin red lines that you might be able to see in the reference map. And um, then basically, I'll go into a different direction. Again, you see um, where the slab is shallower than about 80, 100 kilometers. Um, the T-star operators are relatively low. And um, when, this, when the seismicity gets deeper than that or extrapolate deeper, we see this big step in attenuation. And we think that's a simple reflection of um, now the signal is starting to sample that hot mantle wedge um, and get out from under the cold nose. This is probably the region where milk gets produced uh, to make volcanic centers. Um, the little dots, the red ones are the P waves, the blue ones are the S waves, the scales are a little different, but I think you can see the overall pattern pretty clearly in both of these. So again, we're seeing what looks to be, you know, two different subduction zones segments, a lot of similar properties. They're close by each other. Um, they're going off in different directions and you can see things like seismicity and volcanism are different between them. But um, we think there's good evidence that this other piece of slab that there is other piece of volcanism is just another product of subduction here. Um, as we get shallower, I'm going to look at sort of the up to part, the, um, the seismicity is a really important tool. Uh, so this is showing a figure from a paper that Jiao Li published uh, about eight years ago, showing, um, so the bottom is this is the AEC catalog. This is in the area where there's already a fair number of stations. And then the upper two panels are two different versions of seismicity detected and located using mostly the moose array. And you can see just you know, the incredible refinement that's available. You can see um, very distinct thrust zone geometry. Um, <coughs> The, this is a long story, but um, when we look very carefully comparing to mechanisms of velocities, all like they're actually inside the downgoing plate. We don't actually ever see thrust faulting mechanisms here. We see some upper plate structure as well. Uh, we're doing the same thing now in the Wrangell Volcanic Field. This is a paper by Kira Daly that was just accepted at JGR. Um, and you can, you, know, you can see sort of a similar thing. There's not much seismicity that's deep, but we do see you know, a few dozen earthquakes deeper than 50 kilometers. Um, we're doing slightly different things on these two sections, uh, but the black dots should be um, you know, two different versions of our detected located catalogs. And you can see pretty clearly this continuity between the seismicity under the volcanic arc. That's the red triangles on the top panel uh, are the volcanoes. Um, and, it, and it continues all the way to the shoreline. That's this white gray transition. The depths get a little funky offshore or we don't have any seismometers. Um, the big red lines, if you're wondering, uh, those are connecting to the standard catalog locations for earthquakes are also in the standard catalog. We think a lot of this has to do with, um, uh, th there's something very discrepant in the velocity model that the catalog uses. And I can talk about that in detail if you want, or it's described in Kira's paper. But. Um, so we think we have a good handle on where the earthquakes are. This is again, the Moose Bear Line. The other thing from the things like the migrator sear functions, we have a good handle on what the velocities are. And you can see that um, when we line these things up using comparable velocity models at, in the thrust zone, that's the shallow part of this on the left. 
the earthquakes are inside the red region. Uh, Young Hee Kim, when she analyzed, spent a lot of time trying to model that thrust zone as a thing, you know, maybe two to five kilometer thick low velocity layer. The velocities you can see are stepping down, you know, a couple tens of percent. Um, it's much thinner, resolvably thinner than say what Ferris et al. found in the deeper part of the zone. So we're not looking at just the thickness of the Yakutat crust, we're looking at something else here. There's this thin low velocity zone that is associated with seismicity. Um, we see the same thing well, in the, we, we, we see the same thing actually throughout the region. So uh, Michael Mann in a paper that's uh, working its way through review right now at JGR has been um, trying to find, you know, this are the tops and bottoms of this low velocity zone, not just under Moose Bear and, and you can also see hints of it underneath Wolf, but everywhere in between. And he's been able to uh, use uh, 3D uh, common conversion point imaging stacks where you can actually see, and this sort of this panel B shows us uh, the top and the bottom of this thin low velocity zone. Um, this is in the same place as Moose, so we're calibrating it. But for a large number of the stations in southern Alaska, um, he's able to find this correlated from place to place and map it out. And so what he's able to do is make maps of sort of all the major interfaces here. Um, so panel A shows if you get far enough north, you see an upper plate in Moho. Um, but this panel B, or it's this thrust zone depth, that's the, thrust, that's the depth of the thrust zone. Uh, you can see we, get, we can see this thrust zone continuously across pretty much all of Southern Alaska where we have seismometers. And you can see it, you know, dip, it increases in depth fairly smoothly from the coastline. It doesn't seem to show big breaks. There's little changes in dip here and there. Uh, we can also see if we look deeper, what looks like the Yakutat Moho, that's the green thing on the bottom. And we look at the difference between these two, we actually make a map of the thickness of the Yakutat crust beneath the broadband array. And that's that's this uh, panel D, the one in the upper right. Um, and you can see um, it, like the active source images, it thickens as you go from west to east. And in fact, the numbers we get are very comparable to the active source. So, so we think that this picture is holding together really nicely. There's this big, thick Yakutat crust is subducting, at least at shallow depths. It seems to be subducting coherently from at least the Canadian border all the way to sort of the middle of the Kenai where um, it, it, we start to run the Pacific plate subduction and down dip to depths of 50, 40, 40-ish kilometers. Deeper than that, we saw we saw two different segments of slab, but um, we're able to you know, get really nice images of this thin low velocity zone and of the Yakutat crust going down. Um, <clears throat> I, I can give you just a little bit of a teaser for some of the other things we're getting out of this by looking at, <clears throat> um, one of the other things we're able to do with this low velocity zone, um, because we have these dense arrays, is we can not only look at sort of the traditional receiver function phases, this upgoing what we call PXS or a PP as a P or flex off the free surface as P and then converts to S or things like that. But because we can process the whole array together, and again, this is sort of this Bostock Rondonet method we've been using. Um, that we can extract the scattered P wave field. These are P waves that come up, hit the free surface and then reflect. So they're essentially P reflections that stay in P mode all the time. And this is showing, so the bottom right shows the SV component. This has just looking at the polarization of the waves. We can see um, the PXS, the top and bottom of this low velocity zone there, red, blue, then there's the first reflections and so on. But then the other panel on the, all the way over on the right shows the same interface in P reflection. So um, what's nice about that is first of all, we can do the same migration with the scattered P field. And at least as long as the dips aren't too large, we're able to see a lot of the same interfaces. Some of them like the upper plate Moho are actually clearer in this. Um, it gives us, but one thing it gives us for sure is independent confirmation of structure. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is that this gives us another handle on the PVS or Poisson's ratio. Um, uh, it's a handle, it's a little, because the time delays are more, it's a little less affected by interferences um, that often plague sort of the direct conversions. And we're actually able to get what we think are lower estimates of the PVS in the low velocity zone than 
been available from just the SV component. I'm not going to go into that too much here. I'm going to say that, but you should go to Michael Mann's talk at AGU. He's going to tell you all about um, what we're learning about the nature of the low velocity zone here. Um, but I just want to say this is, again, something that's only possible because we have these dense arrays, and by solving simultaneously for a single incident wave field across them, we're able to separate out this P component that you can't really do a single station processing this way. So um, from all of this, I think the first take, out, take home is that we're seeing pretty clear evidence that this thickened oceanic plateau, the uh, Yakutat terrain is subducting. It's subducting um, in two segments that seem to be torn. There's the primary segments attached to the rest of the Aleutian Alaska slab that's the subducting under Denali. Very shallow dip as it goes from uh, the coastline, Prince William Sound, to the Alaska Range. But then there's this other piece. It seems to be offset so much it looks torn where um, it's dipping at about 45 degrees rotated underneath the Wrangell volcanic field. Um, what's interesting and we can speculate about, but I think it's a little hard to understand exactly why, is the Denali segment has a lot of seismicity in the downgoing plate, very little volcanism, whereas the Wrangell system is just the opposite. We see a lot of volcanism. These are some of the biggest calc alkaline volcanoes on the planet. Um, and very little seismicity. And this is probably is something to do with how and where water is released from the slab and transported through the wedge. Um, but understanding, I think those mechanics is sort of a story for another day. Um, and the second story, so it's the deeper part and the shallow part of the story is that this is a continuous plate. This is, um, it includes both the uh, eastern end of the 1964 rupture zone, the largest disparity, and continues basically uninterrupted east, at least to the Canadian border, where we stop finding broadband seismometers. Um, you know, one can idly speculate that it's, you know, this suggests that, you know, the 1964 earthquake didn't stop in the east because the subduction zone stopped, the thrust zone keeps going. So there's some other, you know, that, that the, this next segment has many similarities to what ruptured in 1964. It's really actually very hard to find something that's all that different about it. And it suggests thinking sort of broadly about hazard from you know, other great earthquakes in the area. We do see this low velocity zone. And so one of the big questions is, you know, what is it that's driving that? And um, is this you know, purely reflection of fluids or sub subducting metasediment? Or what is it a damage zone associated with the earthquake rupture itself? Um, so that's sort of what the main part of this talk is, is to talk about the, the set of projects that have helped us really understand um, the eastern end of the Aleutian subduction system, this transition to the Wrangell system, and the effects of Yakutat slab subduction. Um, I'm going to give you just a little teaser, and it's, it's a little something because we haven't actually gotten to the point where we have a lot of results yet, but it's important to sort of highlight the, this Alaska amphibious community seismic experiment. This was an undertaking. If you saw, there's a lot more dots in the map. We had 75. Um, broadband stations offshore, another 30 onshore, accompanying what's probably another 15 broadbands as part of the TA and permanent networks in this map area. Um, it samples the whole system from way out in the outer rise, across the mega thrust, across the arc, into the back arc. Uh, we ran this for, and this was a major undertaking. Um, uh, the whole thing ran for 15 months starting May of 2018 to September of 2019 with some pieces. Um, wherever possible, we added on extra equipment. So uh, the 11 places circled in red, we had accelerometers added, there are pressure gauges on all the seafloor instruments, temperature sensors. Um, we, we had some densification arrays, particularly across Kodiak and Katmai. Um, but then we also put in a nodal array inside this black box there. Uh, other people uh, deploy electromagnetic sensors. We've got the uh, Langset to do active source, um, source generation while the array was here through a lot of the middle of the array. Um, all this data is open. It's been available for a while. Um, I urge you, if you're curious about it, to look at the um, Barczyk et al. 
SRL data mine article it describes the data and a lot of the you know, sort of technical issues that we've found with it so far. Um, there's a couple of pictures showing recovery of a deep water instrument on the left, a shallow water instrument recovered by Jason ROV on the right. You can see the, little, the actual broadband sensor hanging off the bottom of this big gray protective dome. Um, we used uh, <coughs> the Sekuliak, the Alaska ship, for a lot of the recovery, or the Langseth um, for the recovery of a lot of the deeper water systems. Uh, we got most of them back. I think four out of 75 didn't come back, which by OBS standards is pretty good. Um, ancillary data, right? So this is uh, the map on the right shows uh, the air gun tracks and on the lower left shows an example of um, on cruise uh, processing of some of the uh, reflection data that NSL collecting. You see really nice, um, imaging of the trench and the subducting plate going in. We did a ton of extra multi-beaming. So this uh, figure on the bottom is taken as if you're sort of hanging out on above the outer rise, looking inland towards the Schumigans. And you can see all of these little stair step things. These are normal faults. Those are part of this outer rise system offshore of the Schumigans that have never really been imaged before. Um, and the last thing is we've been spending a lot of time building uh, earthquake catalog and distributing that. And Natalia Rupert and Alaska and Grace Barczyk have been working on this. Um, just to say a few things about this. Um, a big goal is to get all the data out as quickly as possible. This is a figure for the Cascadia Initiative experiment, which we used for a lot of ideas how to do this, but showing sort of total numbers of users with time. We need to make one of these for Alaska of that. And it shows um, a lot of people use data like this when it becomes available quickly. Um, the catalog is available openly both um, through, through a couple of tools. The easiest one is it's on the same search as all the other US, Comcat search, all the other USGS catalogs are. You just select ACE as the thing. And this is showing um, not the whole thing. But, um, this is, of course, is a lot of work. Uh, and so this, uh, just the broadband data is three and a half terabytes. Uh, we have another 400 nodes that Lindsay Worthington sort of made work. That's another three terabytes. Five cruises sailing 12,000 nautical miles. That's like halfway around the planet. Uh, there are 14 other land expeditions. I think I bought 73 plane tickets. That includes 41 students. Um, I've been on over 150 conference calls on my calendar related to this and emails. Um, so this isn't something to just do for fun, or right, it's for fun, but you know, on a lark. Um, one thing, if you're interested, we have a blog uh, that's still being updated, alaskaamphibiouswordpress.com, whenever we do field work. Um, a couple, where am I with time? A few more minutes, okay. Um, just a couple of examples of some early results. This is uh, some noise assessments from the BART Check at All Data Mine, um, and at, at two different periods on the, the one. The middle of the screen is a three to eight hertz band showing um, you know, variations in noise, quiet stations on Kodiak, they get noisy both in deep water and shallow, on land and shallow water. Uh, the longer period noise is 20 to 40 seconds, just pretty clear correlations with um, combinations of water depth and water versus land. So the shallow water stations on the shelf seem quite a bit noisier. Um, but the deep water stations, you know, are only a little bit noisier than some of the arc back arc sites that we're seeing. We also documented a small number of stations where timing errors, KT06, this one in the lower left, um, actually, this is a land station that a bear attacked and uh, day 350, and then you can sort of, see, we have calibrations for the drifts. These are all in a data mine article if you want to apply the clock correction, or they're sitting in kind of ancillary data on the IRIS uh, project page. Um, this is where the catalog is. Uh, we were supposed to have the catalog all done by the summer and then this earthquake, this magnitude 8.2 happened in July. And so we got within a month of being done, um, things were stalled, but um, we're actually doing this in two different ways. So uh, the AEC group has used their standard methods, the same, methods and models that they use for their main catalog um, to generate the AEC catalog that sits on Comcat. There's also a scholar work site that's described in various web pages. Um, and we've 
also then at Cornell, we're sort of in parallel using a machine learning method, earthquake transformer, um, to go and see if we can find more earthquakes. And that that's an ongoing project. Uh, we are working next step is actually doing a little bit of training on OBS data to see if um, some of the strangenesses in that data can be learned. Um, but this map is showing you what this catalog looks like. So the black ones are everything in the AC catalog and the extra ones that we got from machine learning are in the red. And you can see, you know, we're getting more outer rise events, more thrust zone events and so on. Um, this particular detector didn't use the full array, just sort of the Western two thirds. Um, if we look in cross section then, um, cross section A, this is the farthest west one. You can see very nicely the double seismic zone that uh, is in the Western Schumigans that disappears as you go to B to the east in the thrust zone. Uh, this gets a little ratty because we're sort of getting out of the array we were using for these re relocations. This is a very active work in progress. Um, Grace Barczyk is going to talk more about this at AGU on Friday at 5 p.m. if you're still there. Um, but um, one of the things that we're finding is we're doing a lot of this in 1D models of minor corrections or standard catalog methods that these really um, severe differences between oceanic and continental crustal lithospheric structure um, <clears throat> are needing to be accounting for. So there's a lot going on in the seismicity that I'm not sure we believe at this point while we're trying to understand those effects. And so really the next step is we really need to do this in conjunction with building a good 3D model for the area. Um, and this is all going fine. Um, a couple of other quick high shout outs, uh, Evans, Nayongo at uh, University of New Mexico has been using a nodal array. This is 398 nodes on Kodiak map on the right. Um, and he's, he's starting to use receiver functions to image the subducting plate. So B is in the south, A is in the north. And you can see very clearly that same low velocity zone, but now it's a lot thinner. This is sort of oceanic crustal thickness type of thicknesses that we're seeing here under Kodiak. Very strong conversions from that. Um, and uh, the group at Washington U, St. Louis, Ajahn Lee has been um, doing ambient noise tomography, joint inversions offshore, looking at, and I'll talk more, other people can talk about this, but it's starting to look at structure of the incoming plate and how that's affecting sort of the shallow parts of the thrust system. These are all things we could do now with OBS. So this is all going fine, but then, you know, we kept having these earthquakes. So um, in 2021, this year, in July 29th, there's a magnitude 8.2. This is the biggest earthquake in North America in 50 years. US. Um, uh, so uh, we then got a small amount of rapid funding to go out and do a quick um, deployment, redeployment of some seismometers in the area. Also, um, so that was coordinated at Cornell. And then uh, Jeff Miller at uh, Michigan State uh, went out to both resurvey GPS monuments and then upgrade and fix a lot of uh, continuous GPS things. Um, we have nothing on the seismology. We put the seismometers out there. We're going to get the data in May. Um, but if you want to read the, the adventure, uh, again, alaskanfibiuswordpress.com was updated uh, for you know, pretty much daily in the 10 days in early August when we were doing all this. Um, this, maybe this figure should have gone before the other one. Um, this is showing roughly what we did. All of these square boxes were seismometers that we occupied or reoccupied. The different colors just have to do with where we were basing them out of and how we got to them. Uh, the little white dots on the left figure are the aftershocks. Um, they, in, in this map, look like they're all inside the 1938 zone. Um, other people have done a lot more work on that, but you can see the problem is that there's almost no land out there. Uh, <clears throat> there's one permanent station um, and that uh, had a broken telemetry link that uh, UNAVCO fixed fairly quickly and I think restored data um, and we're putting in seismometers all around there. Um, GPS efforts involved reoccupation of the blue and green sites. The arrows here are models, there are predictions. The black lines are the transmitting continuous sites um, that were fixed or upgraded. So this is the work that's going. Um, stay tuned on this. Uh, we don't know much about what the results are, but these data, again, are going to become open and available as soon as we get them out. 
anyway, so I think that's about it. I, again, you know, I think that the main point here is that these dense-ish broadband arrays um, have been a wonderful tool for understanding subduction um, at, at the scales where, you know, thermal structure changes where the thrust zone um, sort of <clears throat> occurs and comes and goes. And, um, you know, and by sort of sticking with this for the last couple of decades, we've really been able to learn a ton about not just Alaska, but these systems in general. So that's it for me. Um, I can pause here. I can stop share or what would you like? Thanks very much, Jeff. That was a great talk. Uh, fascinating results and um, a lot of work over, over a period of many years as well. So it's nice to see kind of how that picture has, has filled in with time. Um, I just want to encourage folks uh, that are listening, if you do have any questions, uh, you're welcome to go ahead and tap that Q&A button on the bottom of the screen and you can enter, enter your question there. Uh, it looks like we do have one question that was submitted so far. This, this is from Carl Tape. It says the new Yakutat image under the, uh, the, the uh, Wrangell volcanic field is spectacular. Uh, are resolution tests or synthetic tests done with receiver function imaging such that you can demonstrate a, a thick subducting crust image is not a smeared version of a thinner normal crust? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think the, the simple answer is, you know, we can go back to small numbers of signals that all come from one place and stack them in the way that we did with the bare data. And, you know, you can really look at the timing differences between the signals from the top and the bottom of the crust. So the main, the main way we see the crust is that there's like a, oh gosh, I don't know how far back I wanna go on this, but um, you see the signals from the top and the bottom of, uh, let me see if I have one from one more back. No, a lot more back. Um, yeah. Uh, this thing of the subducting crust. So something like um, the section E, E prime down at the bottom here is one. And then, you know, you can then model and do hypothesis testing and resolution tests to see whether the spacing between the red blip, which is a negative conversion from the top of this low velocity zone and the blue blip, which is the, the bottom of it, essentially the subducting moho, um, how well apart you can tell them in time. And that's what is 18 plus or minus four kilometers comes from, is that kind of test. Um, it's the same sort of thing we did with the bare data 15 years ago. Um, so that tells us about the thickness and then the migration helps fix where these things are in space pretty well. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, I maybe we'll give it just another minute here in case um, we have any other questions that, that do roll in. Um, it sounds like uh, the recent rapid deployment that you guys uh, put together on pretty short notice this summer, um, it sounds like that was a, a successful deployment and you guys were able to get the, the seismic, seismic equipment out uh, where you needed it and you guys are uh, anxiously awaiting the return of those data next spring once you're able to get back out there. Yeah, no, I mean, I was. Um... You know, usually these things take years. So when we did, you know, bear and moose the year before we would go and site and actually build vaults and let them sit there and let the bears get used to them for a year before we put them in. And then this is very different, right? Is you know, the earthquakes on Friday morning or Thursday morning, and by you know, Monday afternoon, you're ready to go. And by Thursday, you have instruments in the air and you know, flying up to Alaska and people ready to go and you're there by Sunday and starting to make it happen. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was um, impressive how well all these pieces fit. Uh, wonderful support from the instrument center, especially just kind of figuring out what was available, getting us equipment that was very easy to deploy and um, helping us with a lot of logistics, you know, batteries and boxes and then um, some great help. You know, because we had been there before, Recently, we had good contacts with, say, the people who could help us get the permits back and the pilots and all this other stuff. And so a lot of it was built about around reoccupying sites that we had been to before sure. or sponging off of um, some UNAVCO geodetic spite sites that were already being permitted. Um, <clears throat> there was a UNAVCO team up in Kodiak at the same time as we were restoring and fixing telemetry. And upgrading things, uh, they are also you know, moving very fast there as well. So that yeah, was a great, um, 
things went together impressively. Now we're just hoping the bears stay away for. <laughs> well, well, we'll um, very much looking forward to seeing the results of all that work and, and uh, what, what, what additional tales can be told with, with that new information. We've had, had a bunch of questions come in here. Um, I'll just start going through these one by one. First from uh, Noelle, she asks, uh, what, uh, what bandwidth gave good ambient noise tomographic results from OBS data? So I have to say, I didn't look at that data. That was um, Jarman Lee, a uh, student working with Doug Weens has been on that image. And I know there's another group in Colorado that's been doing some of this. Um, so the short answer is, I don't know. Um, you know, the standard, well, the long answer has to do with infragravity waves and using pressure corrections and to deal with compliance and tilt to get longer. Um, broader end period range, but you know, I, I think it's been working okay there. Um, the, the main problems, of, well, on Cascadia, where I paid more attention to doing this, um, I mean, the, the deep water stations seem to work really well. The shallow water stations were kind of problematic. Um, it, it, it may just be that a lot of the periods that you care about, you know, 5, 10, 15 seconds, you're seeing so much of local wave noise is sort of my impression that things aren't correlated. Um, whereas, uh, <clears throat> you know, the sort of the, the standard, you know, in the ground source noise field that you see, that you see on land shows up better on deep water once you deal with all the sort of pressure effects. But okay. I don't know. If uh, moving on to the next question here, uh, based on Alaska and other subduction zone data, can you comment if we have a better understanding on why some subduction zones have very large magnitudes and others don't. Um, why do some subduction zones have very large? You know, I, th I think, well, to answer this question wisely involves looking at more places, right? Then, I mean, we can talk about what we know about Alaska, which is that um, there seems to be coming into the trench and through the thrust zone, a very continuous sort of low velocity channel that is probably more than like a kilometer or two thick once we kind of really dig down into it and use the scattered P wave field. Um, it, it seems continuous and at sort of teleseismic P wave periods at least, so these are wavelength, um, it, it, it seems um, relatively uniform as you go through this. Um, I think, you know, the interesting thing would be to go to some of these places where Right, you don't see great earthquakes and try to do the same kinds of imaging. So, you know, is the thrust, you know, is this a physical property of a thrust zone issue or not? Do you see that same kind of sort of through going low velocity channel? I mean, it looks a lot like what you see in Cascadia too, I think, from what you can tell. Um, so that's the only piece of this that I have. Um, it does point to the power, the value of going to places that don't have great earthquakes to understand better the places that do, I suppose. Yep. Okay, uh, next question uh, from, from Joan Gomberg. Uh, do, the, do these new results explain why the concentration of volcanism in the Wrangell volcanic field exists and where the magma sources? I mean, I think it's, it's pretty clear that these volcanoes sit where volcanoes should sit over a subduction zone. We see a downgoing plate, we see downgoing crust. It's about hundred kilometers deep and there are the volcanoes, right? And so, you know, I don't think you need to go much farther than that these are arc volcanoes, and they're big calc alkaline volcanoes with sort of all the geochemical signatures of um, arc volcanoes elsewhere. It's my geochemist friends tell me this. I have to trust them on that. Um, you know, I think why they are so big and why the seismicity in the downgoing plate is so feeble is kind of the interesting question that, um, you know, we drawn cartoons of talking about water going off in odd places and maybe there's a lot of sediment that's carrying the water that somehow is getting out but you know it's, it's sort of a lot of um I don't, I don't think we really understand that very well yet um but i don't think we have to get very far past this looking like normal subduction but the attenuation data also makes it look like we see the same thermal structure beneath the angles that we see everywhere else that mm -hmm. subduction happens great uh, this next question uh, touches on some of the um, attenuation tomography results that you showed. Uh, just wondering what new results will be provided 
by those by that method. And I think you touched on this a little bit in your talk, but maybe you could just say a bit more about kind of some of the insight that these results are going to be able to provide. Yeah. So this is really sort of the first part of the study, and um, I think uh, there's people in uh, Santa Barbara actually who are taking these differential attenuation measurements that we've made and are doing the tomography itself. Um, you know, I, I think so. The first thing is that it's, it's, it's going to give us a much better handle on sort of a good proxy for thermal structure going into the Wrangell zone. Um, interestingly, attenuation still seems quite high a long way north of uh, where the arc is. And hopefully, we'll get a better understanding on sort of how the subduction zone, so the, th the part of the thermal structure that's sort of mediated by the subduction process interacts with sort of the larger North American sort of cratonic, subcratonic structure. Um, I, the differences between the attenuation and the travel time data are really interesting. Um, so far, our best guess is that this is to do with different depth sensitivities. And so we talk about that in the Soto Casaneda paper that it looks like the attenuation signals are much more sensitive to sort of 50, 100, 150 kilometers depth than they are deeper and the travel time data have much more uniform sensitivity. So um, that together with, you know, just in general attenuation data seem much more sensitive to temperature and less to composition. So, you know, between the two of these things, we can sort of get a much better idea of what we're learning about that. So, so I, I think, you know, First order attenuation tells us that in the mantle, temperature plus or minus melt maybe, um, and we can get away from a lot of these compositional things. And so I, I think that's where the real power of it comes in. And then beyond that, you know, if we can get the resolution under the wrangles, and this gets back to the question of why the wrangle volcanoes are there, um, this may be able to give us maybe a more useful tool for looking at the subarc mantle where the melts ought to be created that make these giant things. Okay. Great. Uh, next question here: uh, Does the new do, does the new structural models offer any insight on the Tenali fault that seems to cross the two terrains with not much difference, or the Tintina fault for the north? So, I mean, one thing we've noticed in all of these transects is that there's a step in the Moho across the Denali fault. That on, north of it, it's about five plus or minus kilometers thinner. And south of it, um, and a couple of other people have seen this too in using sort of the bare data or other data from this. Um, what's new is that we're seeing that same step in the, both of the transects where we cross the Denali fault in the um, wolf data. So near the token on the Richardson Highway. Um, so this, this seems to be a pretty consistent thing. And it does suggest that the Denali fault structure is a fairly vertical terrain boundary that cross cuts the whole crust. Okay, maybe uh, one final question then. Uh, what observational gaps still remain in the region, uh, including offshore? And uh, if you had a magic wand, what would you like to fill in in the next five to 10 years and what would that take? <clears throat> oh gosh, well, you know, this map stops west and the arc keeps going and going and going. There's a big oceanic problem in where you know we see normal oceanic subduction underneath really essentially an oceanic plate in the Bering Sea. And you know, I think worrying about questions of continental growth and arc, you know, how arcs are supplied and arc evolution, that's probably a place to go where you don't have a lot of continental crust to look through. That's almost entirely an OBS problem. Um, you know, these proposals have been written off and on over the decades. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things. And there's this question of sort of what the thrust zone is and looks like um, that we're seeing this, you know, through going thin low velocity layer is really interesting. And I think, you know, the problem is these teleseismic signals are just at the resolution limit where we can see this. Um, this dense array across Kodiak, this nodal array, I think is, you know, lights, this thing lights up. And that kind of data, I think is gonna tell us a lot more about that structure. Um, I would love to sort of do that kind of thing in a few different places in and outside of sort of where the 1964 earthquake had, you know, large moment release, no moment release, down dip from it where there's slow slip and, you know, again, into the wrangle zone. I think 
you know, those kinds of studies, there's, I think there's a lot to learn there. And then there's a lot about the volcanic systems too. We haven't really talked much about those, but um, all of this, I don't, as we saw, we, we, we didn't get seismometers on the Wrangell volcanoes, except for a sort of one permanent one right on the top, um, because they're just like in my first picture, they're, just, they're all snow and ice. Um, but not having that kind of sampling makes it really hard to see much about the volcanic plumbing there. So I gotta keep going. We could keep writing proposals. <laughs> um, no, I, I, think, I think we're we've exhausted the road system for this kind of project. I guess I would say there's, but that's okay. And we have to start dropping stations from drones or something to uniformly yes. sample every everywhere we can get. Okay. Um, well, maybe we'll we'll leave it there. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for your for your time and uh, and for sharing all of these uh, fascinating results with us. We really appreciate it. And thanks mm -hmm. to all of you for, for tuning in today as well.